Hillcrest Church video. We hope this message will help you grow. Good morning, friends. Delighted to see uh, everybody, especially good morning to everybody who is joining us online. I love uh, this idea that we are engaging this as an opportunity. So I think about uh, friends. I've been getting messages this morning. I can see families gathered around the table and eating breakfast, people in their living rooms, uh, small groups that are together. I know that there's groups of college students that are together. And we're seeing friends from um, really all over the world. Good morning, Kathy Hill, who's watching us uh, from Maui, Hawaii right now, which sounds awesome. But uh, we're delighted to have uh, everybody here. As we keep saying, uh, look in the description below for all kinds of ways to get connected. Um, today we're starting the last of four messages in the book of Galatians, and this will take us all the way up into Easter. Now, speaking of Easter, there too, I want to encourage you to be looking for uh, ways that we're going to creatively do Good Friday and Easter together, and it's going to be a really neat opportunity to invite neighbors and friends into a really, we'll make it a great 35-minute celebration of Jesus' resurrection on Easter. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is jump back into Galatians. We've spent a lot of time uh, locking in the big handles of this book, like how to understand it, um, how to process it. So uh, if you are just coming in now, like you're just joining us for the first time, like Tim said, you can go to our website, hcbellingham.com, catch up on this series. Each message is about 30 minutes long. You might have a little time on your hands. Uh, now's a good time to kind of jump in and catch up with us. Uh, today we're in Galatians chapter 5. There's only six chapters in this book. We're in Galatians chapter 5. If you would, you can start making your way to uh, Galatians chapter 5 right now. Our theme this morning is freedom in Christ Jesus. Now, to be very clear, so far in the book of Galatians, freedom has meant primarily freedom from the Mosaic law. But but that's not all that Paul means. Now, especially as we get here into Galatians chapter 5 and 6, Paul is opening a much broader theme about freedom in Jesus that comes by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to live fruitfully and faithfully and therefore not enslaved, not enslaved to things like the empire building values of Rome and Roman culture that they're living in, things like aggrandizing self and attainment and competition against one another, aggression, violence, the pursuit of unconstrained and therefore probably unhealthy pleasure. Um, he's going to talk about freedom from being enslaved to fear that is motivated by constant self-thought, and mostly not to be enslaved to the sin and sinful habits that end up making us slaves to ourself and slaves to a kingdom of powers and principalities that hate us. Paul, throughout his letters, and this is not just Galatians, Paul, throughout his letters, argues Jesus came to bring freedom, to bring healthy community, to bring human thriving to bring creativity and joy. Jesus says it this way, I came to bring you abundant life. And what I want to do in chapter 5 today is I want you to just zero in on chapter 5, verses 1 and 13. So if you have your Bible open, kind of find verse 1 and find verse 13. You put a finger on each one of those. Um, they're bookends. And in between these bookends, between verse 1 and verse 13, uh, Paul is once again arguing that you cannot accommodate to any part of the law. Any obedience to the Mosaic law makes you a slave to the whole thing. Um, you may remember that last week I said in chapter 2, he says that if you choose to have yourself circumcised, which is just part of the law, that he actually says then Christ is of no value to you because you've missed the purpose of your salvation. Also in this section, Paul says quite spiritedly, as we've been using, in verse 12, uh, he says, 
If they, that is the members of the circumcision party, continue to push this agenda, then I wish they would just cut it all off. Now, I know that's a grim way to say it, but probably what he means is that they would cut this idea if they would cut themselves out of community. Now, what I want you to remember is that Paul loves his Jewish brothers. He says over and over he'd lay his own life down. He wants to see his brothers recovered. He wants them, too, to be free from the Mosaic law. It's just that he hates this abrogation of the message of grace, right? He wants to make sure we stay on grace and faith in Jesus alone. So uh, let's pick it up, chapter 5. Let's go to verse 1. Galatians verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then we go down to 13. It says in verse 13, So you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. I love this part. But, but don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, but rather use that freedom to serve one another humbly in love. To paraphrase, let me put it this way. Jesus has come that we might be free from the law of sin and guilt. John 8, 36 says, If the Son, and there's the Son who has the authority of the household, if the Son sets you free, Jew or Gentile, then you are free indeed. And he meant that we would have freedom from all the things, not just the Mosaic law, but all the things that seek to enslave us, all the sin of being self-centeredly sinful, all the sin of others using kinds of sin, creation-destroying, community-breaking, and God-denying sin. I I think with those words, it might be helpful at this point to slow down and kind of give a working definition of sin. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking about where does this impulse come from, both within us and from without us. For today, let me define sin like this. Uh, And I don't know if you've heard sin defined for you before, but I want to define sin as like this. Thoughts and behavior that are self-destructive, hurt others, injurious to others, they're creation harming, and God-denying. This is described, in fact, sometimes people are like, why does God care if we sin? Like, what's his hang-up with whether or not I tell a lie? Why does he care how we behave? And I, the scriptures, and here in Galatians, but all of scriptures wants to reply, because he loves us. Uh, when you think of sin in that nature, it makes sense. He says, I love you, and you were created for more. God loves human community, healthy human community. He loves all the things and all the animals he created, and I think he hates, I don't think, I don't have to say I think, I know he hates being separated from his family. I mean, God could no more ignore human rebellion and self-destructive behavior than even a good parent could just stand back and watch their own child self-destruct or rebel against them. I mean, look, even even just a decent parent would chase after a child and say, stop stop self-destructing, others hurting, breaking the things that you live in and denying me. And, and, And God's the best parent among us. So in love, he pursues us, and he cannot help but care about our sin. Because we are meant to be a part of his great kingdom family in a renewed and healed creation with him forever, free. 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 So this raises a thorny and perennially good question in the church, which goes something like this. But how do we live free by Jesus Uh, by the Holy Spirit for our Father God? How do we live free in Jesus by the Holy Spirit for our Father God? I mean, I still sin. I still 
feel sinful thoughts. Sinful things still appeal to me. I still fail to do the things I want to do and, and end up doing the things I don't want to do. And uh, today is going to be the deepest dive into this question that we've kind of touched on a few times throughout this series. How do we live free in Jesus by the Holy Spirit for the glory of our Father God? Um, our journey as Christians into freedom is sometimes described something like this. Well, um, we do all we can to shape our habits, get rid of bad ones and add new ones, so that God can do what he can, which is uh, change our hearts. And, you know, there's a lot of truth in this. We work on habits. God works on our hearts. But I'd like to suggest that that idea is not quite right because it can be a dangerously intoxicating idea that looks a little like it still has a really good, strong measure of our own righteousness. It is seriously disappointing when we fail at it. You know, here is God doing all he can, and we continue to fail at the parts uh, that we are doing. And it runs the risk of either creating kind of a false pride in the things that we do to prove that we belong to Jesus, or like I said, some fall away in despair thinking, I can never really bring my life back into, you know, I, I wish I did everything. If I really believed, you know, this is how I would live. And the answer that comes out of the book of Galatians and out of all scripture, I think is slightly different, but much better good news. So you ready for that? So let's talk about what that answer is. I think Paul is answering in Galatians and again in all of his letters throughout Scripture that freedom with Jesus begins and carries along in these four spaces. Freedom begins as we confess, we believe, we trust in these things that we confess and believe, and then we participate with the Holy Spirit in them. We begin with confess and believe, and these will stay up as categories for you to think about. Under confess and believe, uh, let me begin here in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Now, those aren't going to be up on the screen, but listen along with me. It says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ, to all who believed. Yeah, I wish you could just underscore that. This righteousness has been given to any who believe in Jesus Christ. So that's why there's now di no difference now between Jew and Gentile. For all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us need grace. And all of us are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Let me read uh, 1 John 1.9. Because then it goes into this piece of good news. So if we confess our sins, he, that is God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, he gives us the righteousness of Christ. Uh, Romans 8, 1 says, that is why, therefore, there can be, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me pick it up. Here then in Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 9 through 13, it says, If you, any, declare, uh, pardon, I lost that. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Did you see that? Declare and believe. Confess and believe there. Then you will be saved. Notice it doesn't have like a whole bunch of following. We're going to get the following. It says, confess and believe and you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess and confess your faith and are saved. Uh, as Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never, anyone, never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Confess and believe the truth. And then after confessing and believing, you have to trust it. Jesus said the work of faith in John 6 is to, to believe in the one who was sent. So much of our believing, confessing is then spending, doing the work of trusting in Jesus' 
actual and completed work that he says, he who began a good work in you, he will actually bring it to completion. Let me say this. When anyone, when any human, when, when you, when you genuinely confess and believe you are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, that work is completed. It is done. It is finished. You have been made righteous and you have received his imputed. That means assigned in to you righteousness. In my sentence, underscore the word genuinely because there's lots of talk about who moved, you know, who didn't mean it, who slips away. But I mean when every, any genuine believer is saved, they are totally accepted in Jesus right now, totally forgiven, totally loved. I'm going to be so careful. Even if they do not or cannot get better. Now, they will get better, but even if they cannot, by restriction of time, get better. Like a child murderer in prison who truly receives Christ and has no time to get better is totally saved by Jesus. Do you hear me say that? So it doesn't mean that Jesus will leave you alone. His love always calls us up and in and out. It's always trans. Forming us. It always doesn't leave us in place with time. But I want you to understand anybody who believes, confesses, and believes is forgiven for every sin, past, current, and coming. Great assurance in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must trust that. Then we get to the hard work of participation. We confess, we believe. We trust, and then we participate with the Holy Spirit in our ongoing uh, transformation. And this is, dear Christians, friends, where it comes in that we make every effort. That confess, believe, and trust, and through participation with the Holy Spirit, we are made into the likeness of Jesus Christ our Messiah King, as we participate with the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, this is where it can get tricky, because the critic might say, aha, <laughs> like, uh, there it is, same old religion. You know, sure, founded in confession and belief in grace, but at the end of the day, you still have to be a good person, right? Like, it's still the work of being a good person. And, and Christians might reply sometimes something like this, oh, you know, We never mean for your salvation, right? No, 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 no. Not good work for salvation. But do we mean to keep it? Do we mean to prove it? Um, How many have not felt some sort of... How many can actually rest in the, I will stretch you, I will grow you, I will transform you, but I accept you and forgive you right now exactly as you are? That's hard. You will participate, but it must begin in trust. I don't know how many of you have felt that pressure before. Um, In college, I went to a small, awesome AG college in Kirkland, Washington, but many of my classmates were raised in the holiness movement. And the holiness movement taught them something like this. Um, You can be perfectly obedient, and if you're not, you might not be saved. Now, I want to tell you how many late-night conversations I had with friends soaked in dread because they kept running into their own depravity, fully saved, committed to God, crying out in chapel. They still found themselves desiring depraved things, like in their heart. And they wondered, I, that's it. It must not have worked. I must not be saved. I must not really love Jesus. I must not really have the Holy Spirit. There's still a war in me to behave in ways that don't look like they're aligned to Jesus. And they were in the painful fear, actual fear of damnation. I spent so many nights just bringing friends back, myself too, back into the gospel. To say, here's who Jesus is. Here's what he's completed. Here's what he's done. Here's my identity. Here's my trust. Even having this thought doesn't separate me from Jesus. Jesus isn't disgusted with me right now. I can have this thought and not even be freaking out or screaming at my enemy. I can have this thought and sit at peace with Jesus and just say, I I totally trust that you are not freaked out by this, that you still are with me. You still are bringing peace to me.
I got to tell you, since then, many, many years later, I still have conversations with adult that I am counseling, men who are struggling with pornography or coveting wealth or harboring rage, genuinely and deeply afraid that and at the end of things they might really not be saved. Why do they still want this grim thing that is far from God? And they maybe misread, for example, the book of Hebrews and become deeply anxious. They're re-crucifying Christ and have lost their salvation. And in that moment, I have to say, that is not freedom. That is not the freedom that Jesus brought you. He can bring you into freedom from this brokenness in you, but first you must begin in trust. We must fight, make every effort to stand in what God says about us. You are my son, you are my daughter, nothing can separate you. Can you trust God to say, not even your own stupid behavior can separate you from the love that is found in Christ Jesus? He named every other power and principality on earth. You are included. He says, I love you, begin there. Handle your fear, handle this issue in that space. That freedom in Jesus cries out, still, I don't want this. I don't believe it's my identity. I don't want to behave in ways that hurt me or hurt others. I confess, I trust you, and I'm sad about this, but I am not afraid with you. I am courageous in my identity with you. And that gives you, then you can sit still with the Holy Spirit and say, okay, what's really going on? Let's unpack, like, deep in within me, not just the behavior, but let's unpack, like, what the motive is going on, what drives this. And that's when the Holy Spirit can guide for us what's called mortification, which sounds scary, but it's just killing off of the disease is what they meant when they wrote that. Let's kill off something broken in me and bring to life things that are new and lovely. And it is in the non-freak out, sit with the Holy Spirit, where they begin to do, he and you begin to do that work together, reroute, rewire, and renewing the mind to develop self-discipline even as a fruit. What I love about it is that in that process, you remove the weapon of the accuser enemy. The enemy in your heart And the enemy in the kingdom of darkness, because there can't be that you don't belong. You, by declaring and resting in truth, I am always and still a child of God, and I am free in Jesus. You take that tool away. Now, sometimes people come to me in a conversation like this and says, but the Bible says, make every effort in fear and trembling. Make every effort to live a life worthy of your calling. How do we make every effort, Christian like, don't, I, I got to fit in this. I must do this box of rules. Otherwise, I'm not making every effort, and I'm probably falling short. And I just want to say, listen to me say this carefully, because this is a massively great effort. The great effort that a Christian must undergo is to confess, to believe, to trust, and to participate. That in the midst of Fear in the midst of running into ourselves to trust and believe and to forcefully drive ourselves into the truth of the Jesus gospel, to immerse ourselves in grace and to participate with the Holy Spirit in belief by faith that switches us from who we are kind of in the basement of ourselves and our wounds and motives and gives us the freedom to be in the work of actually being transformed to look more like Jesus. And that work goes way beyond behavior modification by law or guilt. Rooted in safety, this work that is done with the Holy Spirit demands the greatest, I want to say this so slow, the greatest kinds of effort and courage. The greatest kinds of effort and courage. Honesty about what you really think and are doing. Who, who, what is real? Honesty, forgiveness for the people who have wronged you or you feel wronged, and love. Jesus said, love, your, love is a courageous effort. And by the Holy Spirit, we learn to pay attention, to quiet the noise that distracts. And the Spirit pushes us courageously deeper and into, deeper into confessing aloud to God and self and others who we really are, to apologize to others, to those we must, to right wrongs around us. We make every effort guided by the Holy Spirit. I said two weeks ago that the work of the Holy Spirit is superior to anything that an external law can do. 
And I have found, I don't know about you fellow Christians, that as I lean into intimacy with Jesus by the Holy Spirit, Christians I know can't imagine saying, but where's the work? (laughs) Uh, When you lean into that intimacy with the Holy Spirit and let him unpack the true things that are inside, this you will find the hard work. Not the kind of work that says, Lord, Lord, look at all the things that I did. Those are some scary words in Scripture when the Lord says, I never knew you. But the kind of work of honesty, confession, belief, trust, participation, this disciplined effort that is pointed at expressing Jesus' humble, others' first love that declares what he did for us. Again, as often the hardest work we will ever do is to love like Jesus and let the Holy Spirit get deep into what is going inside, on inside of us. Um, I don't, I don't know if you've had this experience, but when you get the Spirit, which is much better, like can get down inside in you, and your own idea that has come by the Holy Spirit of what is the good thing to do, that is a powerful recipe for God pushing you into every effort. I can think of a lot of examples, but uh, let me give you this example from seminary. So in seminary, my history professor was this guy. You can see him on the screen. This is Dr. Garth Rosell. He looks very dignified there. Um, I loved this man. Uh, I admired his work. Uh, He sent us home in my last year in seminary. He sent us home with this huge test, uh, but it wasn't an open book test. It was a test that we were to take at home. Now, I got to a question in the test that I had studied for. I just couldn't recall the exact detail that I wanted, but I had studied for it. So I just peeked at one of my texts, and then I hastened to finish a response. Now, that, that was wrong. And simple ethics would have told me that it was wrong to cheat on a test. But it wasn't ethics. It was the Holy Spirit who would not let me go. I could, I, I honestly could not like shake this kind of reminder. I kept hearing the Spirit say, Christian, let me set you free from this. So I remember not being able to silence that hope. And that is why I remember walking to Garth Roselle's office with, like, my heart pounding in my ears because I knew that I was going to tell him what I did. I mean, I was in seminary, for pity's sake, studying to be a Christian leader, and I was walking to my professor's office to confess cheating at pastor's college, essentially. Well, I told him, and he was disappointed, and my test score was reduced. And friends, I was delighted. <laughs> I, left that, I, was, I left that office singing for joy, set free from this thing, full of joy. I couldn't have thanked Jesus anymore and the Holy Spirit for bringing this moment of freedom in my life through effort. And I got to tell you, since then, a thousand times has the Holy Spirit had me do something, offer a thousand apologies that has saved my marriage over and over, my relationship with my kids and others over and over. Great effort of freedom as I've let the Holy Spirit shape what was inside me. Um, sometimes people also respond uh, to this discussion like this. They, some may point me to the book of James, the brother of Jesus, and James says something like, You show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works, and faith without works is dead. Right, we're familiar with this. So what can can James mean? Could it be that James and Paul are in disagreement with each other? Is the Bible inconsistent in its message? Of course not. Uh, Of course not on both accounts. They don't agree, and the Bible isn't inconsistent. In his letter... James is correcting another kind of false religion that isn't about the addition of the law like it is in Galatians. Uh, And James, Paul's addressing this problem. Some false believers had begun to suggest that believing in Jesus was a religious contract that went something like this. Since Jesus covers all your sin totally and forever, uh, make that contractual deal with God, then go out and do whatever you want. In fact, sin even more so that Jesus' grace could abound even more. Now, I suppose that if you took Paul, twisted his words, and pushed it to its furthest edge, you could get there. But neither Paul nor James mean this at all. 
Um, that's of course not what Paul or James mean because it's not about a contract. It's about a person whom we love and are in relationship with. And neither Paul nor James can imagine a so-called faith relationship uh, that doesn't want to be with Jesus and be like him. <laughs> like, uh, uh, they can't imagine that you would have a relationship on either side that wouldn't want to, Jesus, I love you, and I love that I'm being transformed into your likeness. Let, let me rephrase James and see if that helps. You show me faith that does not delight in being transformed more and more into the life likeness of Jesus, and I'll show you a faith that is dead. And I think that we could agree with that. Life with Jesus, we have a slide for this, life with Jesus delights in the effort of being changed to be like Jesus. If you love him and know him, you delight in finding the freedom of finding your life alive. It's just not like, oh, I have to do that. I love, taste and see that it's good to be with the Lord. Find the joy, the effort of the joy of finding yourself aligned as the Holy Spirit does the deep work inside of us. Now, what this looks like from the outside can be hard. That's why law is hard. Because some would say, I th that person says they're a Christian, but I don't know if I see fruit. Um, ask your uh, fruit, yes. At what scale? Some people are deeply wounded from life and behavior and things that have been done to them. You've got to ask yourself, is there this fruit? Is there confession and repentance and love for Jesus? Because that doesn't come naturally to people. That's extraordinary fruit. Notice those kinds of fruit. And then watch as God unpacks in them at their own scale, on their own journey, his kind of love and transformation. Fellow Christians, and I, I just want to say, we've got lots of people watching online. That for, the, for that matter, anybody, we were made for freedom. God designed us for freedom with him. We are given the absolutely free opportunity to be born again into the kingdom family of God. And in that, totally forgiven, totally loved, and a future before us. We were made for freedom that participates with the Holy Spirit and brings into fruition our identities and lives that both James and Paul would love and we will love and will honor God, not hurt others, not hurt ourselves, not hurt creation. More and more as we're transformed, as we confess, as we believe so we trust in what we confess and believe, and as we participate with the Holy Spirit, making every effort as he guides us to be aligned to good news in our own freedom. And therein lies the journey of freedom to make every effort to embody a life of freedom in Jesus' name. Now, I created a handout that we we're going to hand out this morning. Instead, I'm going to put it online where I've outlined this, how do we make every effort? So I'll be looking for that online uh, shortly after today's broadcast. It's an imperfect document, because I wrote it, probably has some typos, but I mean every word of it, so uh, check it out. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, but rather to serve one another humbly in love. Next week, Tim will be unpacking this great portion of Paul's wonderful message in the book of Galatians. The worship team is going to make their way back up. Would you join me in a prayer? Lord, thank you for Paul and his faithfulness and his strong word. Thank you for the book of Galatians. We love it. We loved being in it. Uh, I can't even imagine. What if you had not saved your word for your church? Thank you that you preserved your word, that we might know who you are and who we are and how we walk with you. We love you. We choose you. Um, and Lord, I pray that many people hearing this message would reestablish a life of freedom with you in confession and belief and trust and participation. And those who don't know you'd go, wait a second, that actually sounds like good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for connecting with Gilcrest Church. For more info on this and other sermons, visit us online at hcbellingham.com or join us at 9 or 11 a.m. any Sunday morning, 1400 Larrabee Ave, Bellingham, Washington.